Hey everyone, and welcome to our coverage this week in Introduction to the United Nations. We're continuing um, a specific issue from last week when we looked at the relationship between human rights and international law. And this week's reading looks a little bit more specifically at um, not just what the UN recognizes in terms of human rights, but what the international community, um, really three decades after 1990, now has um, understood and identified as something more legally codified than just simply uh, morally normative. And so I want to recall from last week two things that we walked away with. The first is that the relationship between international law and human rights um, already contain a number of internationally recognized agreements, mandates, declarations, um, and even institutional bodies within the United Nations. Um, but we also talked about how international law, and this is something that really uh, deserves to be uh, put in quotes here, is still something that is more um, a set of policies, understandings, philosophies um, that states can choose to adhere to um, or to, um, you know, disregard. You know, at their own, uh, you know, at their own risk. Um, but be that as it may, human rights sort of straddle the, um, the you know, the, the divide between what is moral and what is legal. So, in other words, there are enough, um, you know, codified um, documents, um, policies, understandings on what human rights are, and that they need to be upheld and defended. Right. In fact, um, you know, the, the whole element of promoting and defending human rights are written into the UN Charter. So that gives them already some degree of, you know, legal empiricism, more than just simply, um, you know, some moral idea of somebody needs to do something about that thing over there, you know. Um, but we, with that in mind, we need to understand that what human rights are and more importantly, identifying where and when, and I even have to add if they are violated, remains debated among states, right? States which possess the capability to, you know, quote unquote, do something about it. So human rights are, you know, a series of philosophies, moral codes that are becoming more and more legally codified. Right, especially within the last 30 or so years. But they remain works in progress. Obviously, human rights are violated around the world. Um, they happen either in uh, peripheral, middle-of-nowhere places that don't really fall under the attention of UN scrutiny, or if they happen to be in places like China with the uh, Uyghur population right now, they take place in countries that are way too powerful to be sanctioned, to be condemned, or to have any kind of intervention take place. Um, so while we can certainly talk about the development of human rights as a set of um, global policies, we also need to understand that these global policies are, you know, at best one or two steps behind human rights violations, right? So things still happen in the world that we wish that they didn't. Um, what I can say, at the absolute least, is that attention to human rights promotions over the last 30 years um, has certainly produced more of an incentive to invest in human rights studies and try to, you know, mitigate, you know, some areas um, as opposed to just ignore everything. So, you know, I'm, I'm not, you know, going to be here giving you any optimistic um, future, but I want to at least let you know that the promotion of human rights at the United Nations is something that is, as I said, a work in progress, um, but still a lot of bugs need to be worked out of, you know, the declarations and the details and have that translate into actual policy of improvement. So as I've been saying, right, the, you know, the development of human rights has evolved from normative morals to legal declarations. Um, and as I've already mentioned, the subject of human rights, whatever they happen to be, has been an intricate component of the United Nations since its founding. Right? It's clearly mentioned within the Charter. And as we've already talked about, um, many developing states of the Global South 
emphasized the need to expand the understanding of collective security at the San Francisco Convention to include human rights, to include the promotion of human well-being and development. But even then, as far back as 1945, understandings of what human rights are and what constitutes some kind of intervention when they are violated are long debated, right? Debated between those that believe that human rights are just civil and political and those that feel that they need to include economic, social, and cultural. Um, the Global South tends to be more in favor of the economic, social, and cultural, while the more developed states look at human rights still primarily within the civil and the political. Now, human rights have been, as I've already mentioned again and again here, an institutionally codified philosophy as early as 1945. In fact, we could even go before that. League of Nations, other examples that predate the United Nations. But as I've been mentioning, one of the big recurring themes here in this class that it was, you know, it was not until 1990, right, this, this, this magical special turning point year, um, when the United Nations developed more proactive policies in its promotion and defense. And, you know, we've already talked about how the UN becomes much more proactively involved in intervention and sanctions because the Cold War ends, the bipolar system of power um, no longer hamstrings the UN, into, you know, just kind of being boxed in as this institution that's more for, you know, rhetorical action than anything else. We need to say that, you know, not just the Cold War, but also the onset of the age of globalization, right? And th there is a very short window between really the final end of the Cold War, which is like 1990, 1991, and the beginning of the onset of globalization, which is more like 1994, 1995. Um, and, you know, with the apparent ideological victory of the United States um, over that of Soviet communism, right? There is this understanding that we're at this threshold of a new um, age of international interdependency. And part of that um, includes the liberalist philosophies of promoting human development, um, you know, welfare, well-being, intervening um, where there is injustice, where human rights are being violated. Um, and now that there is no, um, you know, Soviet obstacle, diplomatic Soviet obstacle to intervening um, in places where civil wars and ethnic cleansing and, um, you know, the violations of uh, the rights of minorities, ethnic, religious, political, linguistic, um, you know, the, the need to do something, the, feel, the, the moral need to, um, you know, act in a humanitarian manner, um, I think is also one of the primary catalysts that moves discussions of human rights more into uh, legal declarations. So, you know, if the United States has, you know, a certain image that it wants to promote around the world, um, you know, more than, you know, market capitalism, um, it has to play this humanitarian card. And with um, catastrophic events like ethnic cleansing in the Yugoslav civil wars, famine and starvation in Somalia, um, genocide uh, in Rwanda, I mean, these are just three examples among others, um, it's becoming increasingly difficult to ignore um, human rights promotion, and hence the reason why human rights have become more and more of an issue that the United Nations takes on. And so in this sense, we are you know, sort of linking the ideology of human rights um, to larger discussions of ideology in international relations, you know, which has long been a delicate and complicated subject. Um, you know, realists, um, you know, especially classical realists, traditional realists, um, you know, made the argument that ideology should not enter into um, any kind of international discussion, any kind of international debate, um, simply because every state has its own ideology. And because there is no overarching power that um, overshadows the state, right, every state has its own way of looking at the world. And so, you know, every country is going to make the 
argument that, you know, some divine um, justification, um, you know, backs their own claims for expansion, power, security, whatever. Ideology leads you into conflict that you otherwise would not get into. Um, it kind of drags you into wars. It um, forces you to make alliances with other states that you other that you uh, that you otherwise would not do. So, you know, realism, at least up until the early 20th century, um, had kind of astutely said, leave your ideology at the door um, because everyone's got one and it just you know, risks eroding one's power and security. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, liberalism looks at ideology and seeks to embrace it because liberalism is, it's, is, is in itself an ideology, right? An ideology that, um, that there are certain universal values and laws that protect the rights, the freedoms, the liberties um, of all humankind. Um, and what makes liberalism um, kind of win this argument is because they're more likely to use institutions like the League of Nations or the UN um, as a way of, um, you know, sort of c constructing these ideologies to promote. And then within, uh, you know, the more recent studies of constructivism, um, ideology is certainly used as a way of promoting the identity of a state. But when it comes to organizations like the UN, um, the UN can kind of take on a life of its own and use the ideologies of liberalism to brand itself um, as one of the chief promoters. So rather than um, you know, liberalism seeing that states like the United States or the UK or France or Germany use the UN for its own idea for its own ideologies. Constructivism will say that the UN will be based on certain principles and philosophies that over time will just kind of become self-reinforcing. And the United Nations taking on the responsibility of promoting um, and expanding our understanding of human rights. Um, over the past 20 to 30 years, um, I think, you know, puts the debate squarely within the liberalist uh, and the constructivist corner here. Um, in this, you know, in so much as institutions can codify ideology into global public policy. Um, so, you know, when it comes to the debate on ideology and international relations, um, you know, the realists, especially the pre-Waltzian uh, realists, um, have kind of lost out. And it's really the liberalists, the institutionalists, and the constructivists that um, argue rather convincingly that ideology not only can work in the international field, but it can serve as a moral compass for, you know, member states within organizations like the UN uh, to live up to. And, you know, as we've seen throughout the UN's history, we have the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was passed, you know, way back in 1948, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, 1989, uh, the Declaration on the Rights of Persons Belonging to National or Ethnic, Religious, and Linguistic Minorities, 1992, you know, gives you a sense that the United Nations has been, um, you know, actively seeking to create some kind of collectively understood, shared, um, you know, global public policy. It really is not until the Conference on Human Rights in Vienna, 1993, that we begin to see a real definitive shift uh, towards moving ideas of human rights more so into the legally understood. And that is because this debate about whether human rights includes the social, the economic, and the cultural was made definitive, you know, at the Vienna Convention, in which the universality and the indivisibility of human rights include all five, right? Civil and political, but also economic, social, and cultural. Now, what this means is that it brings into focus the understanding that the promotion of human rights also includes the promotion of human development, well-being, and sustainable living. Now, if you want to add the constructivist element to that, it, you know, what Vienna 1993 does is it creates the foundations of a collective belief that human rights really have a social democratic ethos to it, right? If the goal of the United Nations is to eventually promote 
policies of social democracy, social well-being, and equity that would otherwise be the responsibility of you know, democratic states to do. But more than just that, the UN will begin to look at things that it regards as the causes and the consequences of human rights problems, like poverty or illiteracy or the lack of resources, the lack of clean water, the lack of um, you know, abundant food. Whatever these happen to be, these are um, causes and consequences of human rights violations that can and should be subject to some form of legal prosecution. And herein comes the you know, discussions of sanctions, intervention, things that we've looked at in the previous couple of weeks. The Vienna Convention also, uh, among you know, universalizing um, human rights, asserts the rights of women as an integral part of human rights. So there definitely is a social aspect to that. And it furthers the obligation of states to ensure the rights of minorities. And this also extends to indigenous populations. So in the last couple of weeks, we've kind of discussed the idea that, you know, you know sovereignty remains a paramount issue uh, among states, among UN member states. Um, and sovereignty is something that cannot and should not ever be violated. But yet at the same time, when we expand our understanding of human rights to be not just a series of social democratic values and principles, but that states now have a responsibility to uphold these rights, to promote them to their own people. And if they don't, right, the whole concept of sovereignty now becomes an issue of whether the United Nations um, should step in. Um, you know, do states... Um, can states hide behind um, sovereign independence if they are violating human rights, right? This is kind of a new thing that, well, not, ex not exactly new. I mean, it's been on the UN Charter since the 40s, but it's really only been considered and, uh, you know, implemented uh, since the mid-1990s. So to sum up, right, and just kind of like a midpoint recap to make certain that we're all on the same page here, since the end of the Cold War, and this has been a, a narrative that we've been using almost every week, the UN discourse on human rights has significantly developed and expanded to promote ideologies of social democratic liberalism that emphasize the critical importance of human rights. I think this is pretty plain as day here. And secondly, by harmonizing human rights to consider a number of conditions, and to include a number of groups, the UN promotes this sense of all human rights for all, right? Which sounds lofty. It sounds, you know, overwhelmingly inclusive. Um, you know, the rhetoric is oftentimes uh, blunted by what the UN can do or where and when it chooses to intervene, right? So, you know, all human rights for all, you know, seems to be a bit ironic considering the plight of the, you know, Yazidis of Iraq, the Uyghurs of China, the Rohingya of uh, Myanmar, uh, the Kurds of Syria to, you know, name just, you know, four uh, cases. Um, but the understanding is that, you know, the policy is there, and it is becoming, or at least we think it's becoming, uh, more and more of, a, of, of, of an imperative for states to adhere to. Um, this, of course, then means that the expansion of human rights as a front and center issue of the UN is going to develop um, a sense of a global public policy, right? Sort of a, a global public forum, which will, at the absolute least, create a set of principles, beliefs, values, tenets that might not necessarily be enforced by the UN, um, but there is a sort of soft diplomacy that the UN uses to coax states into acting certain ways uh, and preventing them from taking other, let's say, self-interested measures. And, you know, we've seen 
within the last 20 to 30 years, the UN, um, you know, kind of expand its roles and its capabilities through uh, responsibility to protect all the ideas of interventionism that we've examined and talked about beforehand. And when we bring international law back into the, t uh, into the discussion, we see the um, establishment of a number of uh, war crimes tribunals uh, to prosecute all kinds of crimes against humanity, right? So, you know, taking uh, a page from the, uh, you know, Nuremberg model of 1946, uh, the understanding is do, you know, we don't punish a country and we don't collectively punish a people for being associated with a war or a government that committed all kinds of crimes, but we go after the upper leadership. We go after the president or the prime minister. We go after a number of generals or terrorists or warlords. Um, you know, these things were set up and are still existing for the former republics and territories of Yugoslavia, um, you know, Rwanda, uh, Cambodia, Sierra Leone, uh, the Central African Republic, to name a few, right? To name a few, right? Obviously, war crimes tribunals are not set up for every single country, um, and it would be a hoot and a half um, if the United States actually were to send some of its own, uh, you know, officials to be prosecuted. That's never, you know, that's never going to happen. But this does create, at least in a subjective sense, an understanding that the global forum is becoming more and more populated with collectively recognized um, principles, beliefs, and tenets of human rights, um, you know, values. And it is, you know, if nothing else, you know, an evolutionary process uh, that has been unevenly developed uh, amid continued defense of state sovereignty and power relations, right? So, you know, in other words, you know, countries like China or Turkey or Russia or the United States are certainly going to um, try to wiggle their way out, avoid um, any kind of, you know, war crimes prosecution, um, you know, intervention from the outside. And we expect that to happen, right? I mean, let's not, you know, be, you know, overly optimistic. But it's a process, an evolutionary process that has created an increasingly popular mindset among citizens, NGOs and humanitarian groups. So even those countries that might avoid, um, you know, direct prosecution, condemnation, censorship uh, by the international community, um, they're not immune from public protests and opposition uh, by the people within. Um, we see protests um, happen, you know, throughout Turkey. Um, <clears throat> we see protests in Russia. Um, certainly in, you know, many, many cases in the United States. And this is all, you know, based on these global public policy ideas of, you know, liberalist uh, philosophies. Still, right, still, the United Nations has been, I would say, pretty active in beginning the process of institutionalizing the promotion of human rights. And if we haven't gotten to, you know, full universal international legal acceptance, um, we certainly have a number of institutions that promote it more and more as an acceptable norm, right? And here in the UN, uh, there's really uh, two institutions, two organizations. The Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, which is connected directly to the UN Secretariat, and the Human Rights Council, which is kind of like a subcommittee uh, within the General Assembly, right? We'll do uh, both uh, here. Um, the High Commissioner for Human Rights was a direct establishment through the Vienna Conference, right? The 1993 uh, Vienna Conference as the leading UN entity on human rights. And as I said, being part of the UN Secretariat, the High Commissioner is also um, a UN Under Secretary General. So it's sort of like, you know, think of it as like a, one of the Vice Presidents, um, one of the Vice Chancellors or whatever uh, of the UN. And the OHCHR has, you know, missions and 
operation, you know, field operations, offices, uh, really all around the world, right? They are um, extremely pervasive. I, th I think, you know, the bulk of their administration is based in Geneva. Uh, there's sort of like a small um, auxiliary unit that's based here in New York. Um, but the High Commissioner for Human Rights is really to be found, like, in the field, um, in the areas of conflict. Uh, they are directly um, engaged in conflict resolution packages, especially if the United Nations is involved. Um, they are part of a number of UN peacekeeping missions, um, more so because rather than just keeping the peace, rather than, you know, the, the old-fashioned um, models of uh, conflict management, negative peace. Um, the, you know, the High Commissioner for Human Rights is responsible for at least investigating the groundwork for what can be done for peace building um, and reaching some kind of um, reconciliatory condition between two or more warring groups. On the other side, you've got the Human Rights Council, which, um, as I said, is an organization within the General Assembly. So it's like a subcommittee in which various UN member states are elected uh, to, I think it's, you know, like a two-year term uh, in which it's, it's like an internal audit, right? It, you know, whereas the, the High Commissioner for Human Rights is more of a on-the-ground problem-solving um, entity, the Human Rights Council is kind of like an internal, um, it's, it's like an internal revenue board. Um, it, it works to make certain that all member states are compliant with the Vienna Convention, right, upholding the five principles of political, civic, uh, social, economic, and cultural, um, but also in adhering to any and all previously existing uh, declarations and agreements. So it's kind of like the closest thing the UN has to enforcement, but rather than direct enforcement in a particular area, it tries to, I mean, at least its you know, mission statement says so, it tries to enforce, it tries to get um, all other members of the UN to adhere uh, to these principles. And all states, um, through Human Rights uh, Council, are subject to what are known as universal periodic reviews, or UPRs, every four years. Um, it's basically an audit. Right? It's basically an internal review that measures the degree of human rights within each country. And, you know, like, uh, you know, Freedom House um, publishes um, a review of every country every year on the state of democracy, uh, the Human Rights Council kind of does that on, uh, you know, the level of human development, um, you know, minority protection, cultural rights, women's rights, whatever it is, um, every four years too. And within this UPR, uh, there's a whole bunch of what we call special procedures mandates that, uh, you know, looks at, among other things, the water quality, the, you know, the, the levels of sanitation, um, education, healthcare, um, environmental rights, right? All are meant to promote this universality of human rights that was agreed upon um, at the Vienna Convention. Um, so you might think to yourself, well, well, you know, you know, the UN is, you know, finally getting its act together. You know, it's, it's one thing to just kind of rhetorically say we promote human rights in the Charter, and there's something else in making certain that your member states are compliant. Um, but before you think that this is the best thing out there, right, the Human Rights Council has come under uh, significant scrutiny over the years. Uh, because, you know, in an, in an effort to, um, you know, make it look like all UN member states are somehow eligible rather than just giving it to, you know, the consolidated democracies of Western Europe and North America, um, you know, we oftentimes get this weird uh, arrangement where you have like Syria or Saudi Arabia or uh, even, um, you know, North Korea <laughs> somehow get onto uh, the human rights councils. And it's sort of like these states that, you know, have widespread human rights abuses uh, now have delegates at the UN that are tasked with these universal periodic reviews. Um, so, it, you know, it's just sometimes, you know, bureaucratic ineptitude can be hilarious. Um, you know, if I had to put my money 
on which one was the more important. I mean, I would definitely say uh, the Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, really for two reasons. One, it's much more on the ground. It's in the field. Um, and number two, <clears throat> it doesn't have these, um, you know, electoral faux pas uh, in which you will have countries with significant human rights violations uh, somehow take part in, you know, the human rights councils. Um, now, whether, you know, the people that represent those countries, you know, kind of believe in the cause, you know, that could be, you know, that second level, uh, that second circle of the UN where, you know, technically it really doesn't matter what country you come from, you know, you have a job to promote, you know, some kind of international uh, human development. Well, you know, that's one thing. It kind of takes a leap of faith, but, you know, it's just something to at least mention. So, you know, look, this is a short lecture this week because we're just kind of emphasizing things that we, you know, looked at and discussed um, at length last week. And, um, you know, I want to uh, just kind of end on this idea that the promotion of human rights at the UN remains an ongoing project, all right? Um, human rights in the world certainly lag far behind UN ideals, all right? Let, let's make no bone about it. Um, but if anything, right, if anything, the last 30 years um, has witnessed um, a significant increase in attention to and investment in human rights development. So, you know, not for nothing, but, you know, that's got to say something. Um, certainly, it's a work in progress. Um, certainly, human rights continue to be violated in areas that, as I've mentioned before, um, are either of little interest to global attention or happen in states that are strong enough to resist uh, outside sanction or intervention, right? So, you know, that, that fine line between human rights being violated and the UN feeling the need to do something and intervene in the name of human rights protection, I mean, you know, that Venn diagram crossover is, uh, you know, pretty narrow. Um, and I don't want to just simply emphasize on those rare cases where it all works and then pat the UN on the back. Um, there are still a lot of issues that are overlooked um, or are just, you know, unable uh, to address. But if anything, I would say the moral normativity of defending human rights just as a, you know, concept, coupled with what we've clearly seen as an expanding legal codification and emphasis on human rights defense and promotion um, gives one some, you know, guardedly optimistic sense that the, uh, the last 30 years may very well start a trend for further development, refinement, and progress. You know, so in other words, you know, the UN has only started to really be the UN. It has only started to be a global organization promoting um, human development and social welfare um, in really only the last 30 of its 75 years. So, you know, I don't want to say that the UN, you know, needs to get all its proverbial bugs out, but it really only has become um, a global institution within the last 30 or so years. And even though there are many areas in which human rights violations continue to happen, even while the UN has conference after conference, um, these agreements, these memorandums, these understandings, whatever it is that you want to call them, um, they do produce some good. They do create some um, understanding that states increasingly are at risk of some kind of international condemnation, isolation, even intervention, um, if they violate um, a number of human rights issues on a number of fronts, not just civic and political, but increasingly economic, social, and cultural. And, you know, I would even add a sixth element, um, if it doesn't fit into any of the previous five, um, environmental because environmental can affect the economic, the political, and the social 
right? It can create a number of consequences in which either the target population suffers, it starves, it migrates, it reacts, it, um, you know, radicalizes. I mean, anything like that, you know, can go back to uh, some kind of human rights violation, which, of course, can go back even further to a deterioration uh, in collective security. So, you know, as the world is becoming more interdependent, more interconnected, more globalized, right, we find that, you know, problems that, you know, happen in some, you know, middle of nowhere corner of the world can actually have ripple effects that come back to really affect, um, you know, other major developed countries. And so this is something in which the argument for human rights and by extension our previous discussions of intervention uh, say is, you know, a moral imperative to address, right? It's looking at <clears throat> and mitigating conflict before it metastasizes <clears throat> and just gets worse. It spreads to other countries, destabilizes, you know, entire regions and creates, you know, an honest uh, security dilemma. So human rights, both, you know, a moral as well as a legalistic imperative is something that will continue uh, to dominate um, discussions, debates, and discourse uh, in the UN in the years and decades to come. Right? And, you know, like I said, it's a quick lecture, a real short one uh, covering two very easy and straightforward readings. And, uh, you know, we've got a lot that we can talk about uh, this coming week. Um, and I welcome your thoughts, your input as always. And uh, yeah, you know, thanks for listening. Again, quick short one this week, and uh, I will see you in a couple of days. Take care.